60 years ago, I stepped out of the shadows of the school entrance into the bright sunshine of the school playground. And wham! I was hit by a boy running at full tilt. He was playing tag with another lad. I was sent flying, and my knee took the brunt of the fall. I don't think it was properly cleaned up and probably should have been stitched. It caused trouble for several weeks with a nasty infection, and a large skin tag eventually had to be cut off. I have a scar on my knee. It has faded now, along with the memory, but both are still there. This is a trivial incident, but we all live in a fallen world. We all have the scars to prove it. Injuries, medical conditions resulting in operations or disfigurements, but not all illnesses leave a physical star, but they are no less serious. And of course, there are things that leave a star on the mind, the loss of a friend, a relative, a disappointment, a lost job, a broken relationship, the pressure of work or of none, economic pressure of a mortgage increase, inflation, and so many things that leave a star on the heart or the mind. But how do we deal with these things? Where do we turn for help? Where do we get help? Sometimes the medical services can help with an injury or an illness. We can seek comfort uh, or help from friends or family for distressing situations. Maybe we can seek help from our employer or from the bank if it's an economic problem. There is the government or the police or the courts who deal with social injustice or criminal matters. But for the Christian, the first port of call should always be to the Lord our God. It is he who has allowed these things to trouble and these difficulties to come into our lives. What does he want to teach us? Perhaps he's seeking our dependence on him because so often the cause of problems is that we seek to stand in our own strength. Jesus came into this world to experience the troubles we know, to live our life and die our death. And sometimes he allows us to go through troubles so that we too can in turn be a help to others who experience problems and pains in this life. Sometimes it is so that we can be seen to live a triumphant Christian life as a witness to other people. Paul knew of these physical troubles. In 2 Corinthians 12, he says, Therefore, in order to keep me from being conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardship, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul's thorn in the flesh is not specified. That is helpful to us because it can stand for all those illnesses and problems that we face. God's grace is sufficient for our needs in times of trial and difficulty. There's an old hymn that I was reminded of. He will carry you through. He will carry you through. Just trust in the Saviour and be true. And when the trials you receive, trust in God and still believe that he will carry you through. But there is much speculation about Paul's thorn in the flesh. Piecing together evidence from scripture, some believe that he had an eye injury 
caused by being stoned at Lystra. If that were true, then Paul's thorn came as a result of the sins of others. And how true that is of many of our scars. The criminal who steals the worthless keepsakes of a distant loved one. The colleague whose theft destroys a business, leaving others out of work. The wantonly careless driver who kills a relative or friend. Paul knew these situations too. He had these scars. In 2 Timothy 4.14, he mentions Alexander, who did him great harm. And in the same chapter, he laments that when he was brought to court, everyone deserted me. In Psalm 55, David laments the betrayal of a close friend. It is sometimes thought that David was referring to Ahithophel, his close and trusted advisor, who sided with Absalom during the latter's rebellion. But it is also seen as reflecting Judas's betrayal of the Lord Jesus. The hurts and injuries that others bring into our lives are hard. How do we deal with such things? Again, we must leave them in the hands of God. He is the just judge who will reward people according to their deeds. Sometimes there is no justice in this world, but the eternal judge does not forget. He remains our comfort and he will repay fairly and justly. But sadly, the scars of sin are often from our own sins. Cain's sin left him with the mark of God on his body. Miriam's rebellion against Moses left her with leprosy, as did Uzziah's pride when he usurped the authority of the priests and tried to offer incense in the temple. Paul knew these scars too. In 1 Corinthians 15, he acknowledged this scar. For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But he goes on to acknowledge the mercy of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. There is a degree to which this past failure, uh, which caused, uh, which alongside the mercy of God, was to drive him on to serve faithfully as a minister of the gospel. My dad used to have a little saying. If you do a favour to someone, never remember it. If someone does a favour to you, never forget it. And the same principles can be applied to the forgiveness of our sins. God promises in Isaiah 43, 25 to remember our sins no more. And in Psalm 103, verse 12, tells us that God has removed our sins from us as far as the east is from the west. But let us not forget that it was because of our sins that Christ died. Our sins are not a trivial matter. We owe him such a great debt that we should not forget it. We should not forget the shame of our sin, the injury our sins have caused others, even though we are declared righteous by the mercy of God when we confess our sins to him. The scars of the crucifixion that our Lord bears are both reminders of our sin and of his love towards us. On my computer, I have downloaded many Christian songs and hymns. I have these running in the background as I work on sermons. And there's one song that might seem a little strange at first, but it expresses these same issues. I used to wish that I could rewrite history. I used to dream that, I, that each mistake could be erased. Then I could just pretend I never knew the me back then. I used to pray that you would take the shame away, 
hide all the evidence of who I've been. But it is the memory of the place that you brought me from that keeps me on my knees. And even though I'm free, heal the wound, but leave the scar. A reminder of how merciful you are. I am broken, torn apart. Take the pieces of this heart and heal the wound, but leave the scar. But there is one more category of scar that we must talk about. It is represented in our passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. This is an odd passage. Paul founded the church in Corinth under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. He stayed there some time teaching them the way of God. Yet the church there seems to have abandoned God's ways quickly, just after he left. They also began to doubt the status and standing of, of Paul the Apostle. Other people had come along and maligned Paul and his work. These so-called super apostles claimed greater standing than God's chosen messenger to the Gentiles. And so Paul illustrates his standing by highlighting his suffering for the Lord and for the gospel. Verses 23 to 28. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have laboured and toiled and often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Some of these events will have left physical scars. Others will be fears and memories that need to be dealt with. These days, people often talk about post-traumatic stress disorder. And we're aware of the sorts of problems that PTSD brings, even if we've never experienced them ourselves. Such are the scars of Paul's Christian service. The labouring day by day, perhaps without seeing any results. The concern for the church, the church that seems to abandon the teaching they receive for the latest gimmick, the latest theological fad, the easy gospel of compromise with the world. Often, such scars are much deeper than the 39 lashes and the cut of rod or stone. I was reading a book on spiritual leadership last year. And I came up across a poem widely attributed to Amy Carmichael, a missionary to India in the first half of the last century. Hast thou no scar, no hidden star on foot or side or hand? I see thee, I hear thee sung as mighty in the land. I hear them hail thy bright ascendant star. Hast thou no scar? Hast thou no wound? Yet I was wounded by the archers spent. I leaned me against the tree to die, and rent by ravenous beasts that compassed me, I swooned. Hast thou no wound? No wound? No scar? Yet as the master shall the servant be, and pierced are the feet that follow me, but thine are whole. Can he have followed far, who has no wound or scar? For some Christians in the world, 
there is the threat or reality of physical suffering. Not just the scars of a broken, fallen world or simply of our sins. No, there is the persecution of the Christians, imprisonment, torture and death. There are raiders who come from the forests or from the desert to attack those who call upon the name of the Lord. Recently on the BBC News there were reports about an attack on a school in Uganda. These reports told about how Islamic terrorists based in Congo must have infiltrated across the border and committed their crimes and then vanished into the night. But these reports certainly didn't say anything about the fact that this was a Christian boarding school, that the boys were in their dormitory singing Christian songs and hymns when the terrorists attacked. But as I've said, the Christian stars are not just of martyrdom, but of service. Here's another quotation from the book uh, on spiritual leader by Oswald Sanders that I read last year. It was written by a missionary in Egypt back to his headquarters. But I am weary. I've only written because I'm too tired to be working now. And I'm too tired to sleep. I'm getting prematurely old, they tell me, and doctors do not give me long to live unless the strain is eased a bit. My wife is wearier than I am. She needs complete rest a while. Oh, that the church at home could but realise one half of the opportunities of today. Will no one hear the call? Please do your best to, to help us. This man died after only nine years working in Egypt. The call of Christ is not for an easy life. As he commissioned his disciples in Matthew 10, before sending them out to work, Jesus said this. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. And in Matthew 16, Jesus rebukes Peter for seeking to turn Jesus away from his path of sacrifice. And he again tells the disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. And this from the eternal God who proclaims about himself in Matthew 20, the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The imagery of the cross would have been stark to the disciples. It meant a death sentence had been passed on them. Their life was forfeit. And so it is for the Christian. We have been bought with a price, that of Jesus' blood. We do not belong to ourselves to do as we wish. We become the slaves of a gracious and kind master who desires us to walk as he walked, not counting the cost, but looking to the reward that awaits us. So often I hear of churches that struggle to get the workers that they need for their activities. Recently, I went to the annual general meeting of a Christian organisation that, that donates thousands of pounds each year to churches to help with their maintenance bills. But at the start of the meeting, they had to announce that it was postponed because insufficient number of people were in attendance to make the legal quorum. People were happy to take their money, 
but didn't want to know about the burden of the work of running the organisation from which they had benefited. For too many Christians, the what's in it for me equation is very short term. But to the church in Thyatira that Jesus spoke to in Revelation, he makes it clear that they should be in the long term game. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. This was a church that was renowned for its work, for its love, for their faith, for their perseverance. It did not excuse their sins, but Jesus was urging them on, keep living the victorious life and I will give you power and authority over the nations. In John 4, Jesus speaks to the woman at Sychar's well while the disciples are in town buying food. The woman comes back to, to, goes back to town to tell her neighbours that she has found the Messiah. The disciples' concern is for food. As the townspeople come to see Jesus for themselves, Jesus gently rebukes his disciples. My food, he said, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work don't you have the saying, it's still four months until harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now the one who draws, who reaps, draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life. So that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps is true. I sent you to reap for what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work and you have reaped the benefits of their labours. For farmers, the problem is often getting in the harvest just at the right time. But it takes time. So often there is that critical time between the harvest being ripe and it's being ruined by a storm or just becoming overripe. What is needed is labourers, people who will work for the harvest. There are many churches still without a pastor, many pastors reaching retirement age. Many more men are needed for this work. They are needed to go and do tough, hard work that won't pay a good wage, at least not in this life. Missionary societies need more workers overseas. The numbers have dropped over the years as this nation has turned away from God. Yet the population of the world is growing. There is more need. Our own country has a lower proportion of Christians than has been recorded for centuries. The country is full of paganism as well as, frankly, weird and wacky beliefs. People need the eternal gospel truths. These are the truths that bring relief from the confusion <laughs> of our society which is breeding hatred against those who refuse to kowtow to the ideology that you can be what you want to be. Recently there was a video uh, on the weekly news from the Christian Institute where a teacher rebuked some girls in her class because they refused to accept that one of the other girls had defined herself as a cat and that they should conform to this belief. So the teacher told the girls that they should go and find another school. Only the truth of the gospel is a secure answer to such issues. It is God who made us. We are his subjects. We must repent of our rebellion against his rule. We must confess our sin to the one God has sent to pay the penalty for our rebellion. We must trust in the Lord Jesus for eternal life. Adam 
was created to work and to rule over God's creation. Eternity will be no different. Our task in heaven will still be to worship and to serve God. In Luke 19, the version of the parable of the master who gives money to his servants to invest while he is away supports this. When the master returns, having been appointed king, he rewards his servants with appointments to rule over cities according to how much they have achieved with the resources that they were given. Not all are called to bear the scars of bitter physical suffering. Some are called to bear the scars of humble routine service, of anonymous sacrificial service and giving, of the task that no one else will do, of giving up what we desire for what others will become in the service of Christ. Not all are called to full-time Christian service. For many, Christian service is the evenings spent in the Lord's work at the end of a long, hard day at work. But we are all called to serve. No Christian is called to a life of idleness. Paul's suffering was extreme. His physical scars were many. So too were his mental and emotional scars. But in dependence on Almighty God, he pressed on. In 1 Corinthians 4, Paul reminds the church of his role as father of the church, and he urges them to imitate him. So he also sends them Timothy as a faithful servant of the Lord, so that they can be reminded of Paul's words and the work that he did, so that they will be better able to follow his example. Similarly, in 2 Thessalonians 3, Paul reminds the church of the example that he set them. He reminds them of the way that he worked hard for his living and at the same time proclaimed the gospel to them, just as he does in this passage in 2 Corinthians 11. He urges that church in Thessalonica also to imitate him, to follow his example. And the writer to the letter of the Hebrews urges his readers to imitate the faithful servant of God. First, in chapter 6, he says, imitate those whose faith and patience inherit what has been promised. And then in chapter 13, he says, remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. One school of thought believes that this book was written by Paul, but whether it was or not doesn't really matter. It is the word of God inspired by the Holy Spirit for our instruction and benefit. So we too must learn to live sacrificial lives, carrying our cross of daily suffering, not counting the stars, but looking to the reward that comes from being obedient to the call of God. The 19th century was the great period of British Christian missionary endeavour. Often, as the missionaries set out for somewhere like Africa or Asia, they would pack their belongings into their coffin. Life expectancy for a missionary was short, but they went prepared anyway. Whether you are called to overseas service or just in this local church, I want to urge you to press on willingly and eagerly, not counting the cost, but remembering the cost of your salvation.